Patrick Ellen, I'm chief scientist at Loop AI Labs, uh, which is an AI company in San Francisco that we founded in um, 2012. Um, and uh, at the time, we had certain ideas about sort of a consumer-faced product that uh, we might use, come up with some AI for it. But uh, when we actually developed the technology behind it, we realized that um, maybe we had better technology than the product we were thinking of, and so we became a company that provides a, uh, an AI platform, basically. Uh, my background is actually in cognitive psychology. I did not really study computer science, but I grew up programming and um, studied psychology of language uh, and uh, went from there to being um, sort of involved in speech recognition at AT&T Labs um, and natural language understanding. Um, I actually did a postdoc here at CSLI, right down Panama Street here. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be back. Yeah. So the slides are working now, but thank you for introducing yourself, Patrick, <laughs> because he's actually speaking right after me. So now you already know who he is. All right, so I, let's start again. Hi, I'm Maria Yao, and I have the pleasure of being your moderator today and I will be introducing the topic of the proliferation of artificial intelligence. So if you're not familiar with me, I am the founder of two companies in the AI space. The first is TopBots. We focus on executive education for business leaders applying AI to their companies. We run the largest publication focused on that group, and I run content as editor-in-chief. I'm also the chief technology and product officer at MetaMaven. We build AI products focused on revenue growth for Fortune 500 companies. So we're very fortunate to work with some of the best leaders in the AI space and some of the world's most recognizable brands. These companies are doing truly innovative work in AI, but as you all know, not all companies who say they're doing AI are actually doing something interesting. So earlier this year, I went to CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas, and I was pitched an AI-powered pet food bowl. Apparently, this bowl analyzes your kitty chow for nutritional value and helps you optimize meal plans for your cat. I was also pitched an AI catnip toy. So rather than play with your cat yourself, you can buy a robotic mouse that uses computer vision to navigate around the room and navigate its way back to its charging station. Now, you might be jealous of kitty. Why does kitty get all the AI toys? Don't worry, because humans also get some AI toys, such as this AI-powered standing desk, which I am told, <laughs> I am told it automatically learns your habits and it can automatically order your lunch. And finally, AI can even tell you when to go to the toilet. Who needs diapers when you have AI? So when an entrepreneur comes and pitches you an idea to use AI to disrupt the adult diaper industry, you know that we have hit peak hype. But don't worry, because tonight we're not going to talk about crappy AI, pun intended. We are going to be focused on artificial intelligence for the enterprise. So real world business value for AI. Regardless of what report you read, whether it's Gartner, Forrester, McKinsey, Accenture, they all put some huge number on the total business value that AI can create for enterprises. And they're not wrong, there is indeed a proliferation of tons and tons of AI companies that address specific enterprise use cases. Now, we've profiled up over 100 of them here, so if you want to read this list in detail, you go to topbots.com slash enterprises. But instead, I'd like to give you a more discreet story tonight. Imagine that you are the CEO of L'Oreal. You are concerned about Amazon. Jeff Bezos is known for disrupting supply chain, and beauty actually has some of the highest margins in terms of consumer products. You want to know, how can AI help your company? L'Oreal has tons of fans around the world, and they often leave user reviews. L'Oreal can use AI technologies to turn this unstructured text into consumer insights, to talk about how the person is feeling, what they're saying, what products specifically they're talking about. In this particular case, it was a guy named Tyler who was like, hey, I know this product is for women, but I got wrinkles too and I love this product. <laughs> so I could tell that he was analytical, open and extroverted and that he was very positive about the product. Using these kinds of insights, you can now create better consumer products. So we helped L'Oreal ship a bot for their Kills brand, which had a dedicated men's section. And this particular bot ended up having more engaged male users than female users. L'Oreal fans also post a lot on social media. And now, with technologies like computer vision, L'Oreal can figure out 
when their products and their brands have occurred in user-generated content, use that to calculate earned media on advertising, and also optimize their marketing. Because once you know who is talking about L'Oreal and who their friends are, you can do more sophisticated customer segmentation and targeting to reach a better audience. You can also identify who your best influencers are. Customer support is also a great use case for enterprise AI. And one of the best case studies is Autodesk. A couple years ago, Autodesk switched to a SaaS model, and their customer support requests exploded. And to solve that, they created this bot, Ava. Ava is one of the most successful examples of customer support bots. It's able to handle 30,000 conversations a month, solves 50, 40 distinct customer use cases, cuts the resolution time on average from 38 hours to five minutes, and cut the cost per case from between 15 to $200 to just under a dollar. If you want to learn more about Ava, we actually interviewed Rachel Raycard, who is the director of machine assistant at Autodesk, and she goes into detail about how they thought about and how they built this bot. Generative models are also very exciting. Um, if you're L'Oreal, you want to create an ad campaign, you get to hire an expensive agency. They hire photographers, models, editors, copywriters. But with some of these generative models, you're going to be able to skip that. And we're already seeing that. Toyota, for example, with their digital agency, Saatchi, they partner with IBM Watson to generate computer-generated ads. So do you think you'll be able to tell the difference between content that's generated by a human and content that's generated by a bot? I think we should play a little guessing game, yeah? So consider this text. A shallow magnitude 4.7 earthquake was reported Monday morning five miles from Westwood, California, according to the US Geological Survey. The trembler occurred at 6.25 AM Pacific time at a depth of five miles. Who thinks this was human? Who thinks this was a bot? All right, you're right, this was a bot. Kitty couldn't fall asleep for a long time. Her nerves were strained as two tight strings, and even a glass of hot wine that John made her drink did not help her. Lying in bed, she kept going over and over that monstrous scene in the meadow. Who thinks this is human? Who thinks this is bot? It's about half and half. This is actually a bot, okay. <laughs> Last one. How little we know of what there is to know. I wish that I were going to live a long time instead of going to die today because I've learned much about life in these four days. More, I think, than in all other time. Human? Bot. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> so as you can tell, we are at a very exciting inflection point uh, when it comes to AI and its use cases. And you're going to learn so much from the panel tonight, and they're going to get you very excited about the topic. We can't cover everything you might possibly want to know in one night, though, so I'd like to leave you with three resources you can look into if you're learning more. So the first is our website, TopBots. We are producing a lot of content, technical and business, for people who are looking to apply AI to their companies. The second is a Facebook group I started that helps executives connect with each other, connect with new content, and get questions answered. So if you're looking for this group, you can just search for Applied Artificial Intelligence for Business, and you'll be able to find the group. And finally, as Dana mentioned, I recently just launched my book, Applied Artificial Intelligence, a handbook for business leaders. It was written because when we started working with Fortune 500 companies, we realized there was kind of a big gap in terms of basic understanding required to successfully implement AI solutions at scale. So we wrote this book as a foundational introduction for non-technical executives who are director to CXO level at Fortune 500 companies. So, as Dana said, within two weeks, we actually were able to hit number one on the bestseller list in seven different Amazon categories because of a lot of community support. And I'm also proud to say that I co-authored this book with two other female technologists. So thank you. All right. So next, you guys are going to hear from Patrick. And he already introduced himself, so you can yep. get right into it. Cool. All right. Thank you. Good stuff. Um, so people ask me you know, all the time, what is AI? Because uh, there's sort of you know, just what we used to think of as AI, like maybe speech recognition or uh, even search engines are now just sort of technology. They're just tools. We don't really think of them as AI so much anymore. So AI is always kind of that thing that you're, you're standing on the ledge between technology that we know exists and the stuff that maybe we can't quite do yet. 
Um, and we can talk about, you know, what, what can AI do now and what can you do with your, you know, enterprise business and investing with the AI of today. Uh, and we'll hear a lot about that tonight. It's also really interesting to think about what's AI going to be? Where's it going to go? Um, and uh, so I've only got about eight minutes uh, or ten minutes or so, but, but we'll just cover um, a few ideas uh, that to, to me sort of lead to uh, some basic questions that will maybe help us think of uh, how we can expect AI to really change and really change our lives over the next five to 10 years, um, going beyond you know, what we have now with, with deep learning and, and all of that stuff. Um, so let's just start with humans. Who thinks we're special? <laughs> Most of you? The rest of you maybe should call a psychiatrist. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but no, why? What, why? What, what makes us special? I mean, I guess compared to you know, plants and animals, other animals in the animal kingdom, what, what makes us special? Compassion. Compassion. What else did I hear? Learning. Learning. But other, other, we can lie, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good one, actually. Um, <laughs> We can behave like Trump. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, we can wonder. We can reflect on our, our sort of place in the universe. I guess we don't know that other animals don't do this. Maybe ants, you know, as they're climbing up trees, look up and wonder about things, although I don't think they can really see that far. Um, but I think, you know, lying and, and compassion, these we're starting to get at the things that, that make us uniquely human. Because there are, we know that there are certain things that are special about humans, even if we can't quite put our finger on it. There's some je ne sais quoi that we have that seems to distinguish us from other animals. Um, so if I were going to make an AI system, and I might come to you and I say, oh, I made this brilliant AI system, and I've perfectly uh, you know, replicated this intelligence, and you'd be like, wow, that's awesome. You're going to make a million dollars. I'll say, yeah, I, I created an octopus intelligence. And uh, I'd say, well, Patrick, that's really cool, but it's kind of not what we had in mind when we were talking about artificial intelligence. We don't want to recreate an octopus brain. We want to recreate a human brain, or at least uh, the aspects of the human brain that are, that are the most useful to us. Um, so, so starting from that premise, you have to ask yourself, all right, so what are the things that, that we can do that, that are special to us that we would want a machine to be able to do? How does that distinguish from other things that we might be able to do with AI that are useful but don't really distinguish us as, as humans? Um, so here's an example of some people playing Atari, and I'm sure you read you know, a few years ago, uh, the folks at DeepMind did some really brilliant reinforcement learning AI stuff where they got a machine to be able to play games like Space Invaders uh, just by only looking at the pixels in, in every screen and then knowing every time it got an increased point. Uh, and every time it got an increased point, the system knew it was doing something right. And over lots of iterations, um, you got a machine that was able to play Space Invaders much better than, than a human could. Um, everybody read that and was like, wow, we're like really on the way to AI having an intelligence that's uh, you know, like, like a human intelligence. Um, but you have to ask yourself, could we teach a monkey to, to play Space Invaders? You probably could, right? Um, so you know, it's an interesting achievement, but it doesn't really get at the heart of what makes us human and what makes our intelligence so special according to us. Um, so there's, there's what I call human level intelligence, which is just intelligence that uh, you know, are things that we as humans can do. And it's great if we can get machines to do them, like recognizing faces, you know, detecting pedestrians so you don't run into them with your car, uh, you know, the, the infamous uh, Turing test. Um, so th those are all things that we've, we've seen a lot of accomplishment on just over the past you know, five to 10 years. Um, Going forward, I think we're going to see a lot more accomplishment in what I would call intelligence that more gets at the human capacity. And when I say human capacity, I mean those things that, that we're really good at that other animals can't, can't really do, uh, that we uniquely excel at. Uh, which, which would be what? Uh, please tell us. Uh, well, the main one, I think, is, is manipulating symbols, you know, whether we're lying or uh, you know, doing uh, create creative things, um, that type of thing. Now there are lots of other you know animals in the animal kingdom that seem to have some sort of symbol manipulation going on, and some form of, of communication. Um, 
But there are certain things that only humans can do that we don't really see in communication systems in, in the animal kingdom. And I'll explain those to you uh, really qu quickly. Uh, I didn't make this stuff up, by the way. A, a, an anthropologist did uh, back in the 80s, uh, a guy named Marshank. Um, and he was picked up by a, a few other um, you know, uh, anthropologists along the way. Uh, and it, made it eventually made it into a, a paper that I'll show you in a second that included Noam Chomsky on it. And so this, if, if you want to read more about this, you can go back to, to those papers. Um, but the, the question really being asked in this original paper was just, just sort of, you know, what, what about symbol manipulation seemed to happen uh, that gave us this, this you know, uh, human capacity that we have? Um, so there are a few things that we seem to be able to do that you don't see other, elsewhere in the animal kingdom. Uh, and one is to communicate multimodally. So when I say multimodally, it's, you know, I can talk to you like I'm doing right now uh, and communicate to you through an auditory channel. Uh, or I can write you a message and, you know, communicate to you through a visual channel. Uh, or I can talk and I can point to things and gesture at the same time. And you have the capacity to integrate that. Basically, any message that I can say in one mode, I can say in another mode. And we're actually so good at that that people who have completely lost the primary channel of communication uh, being able to, you know, to hear, uh, are able to communicate in a completely different language and a completely different mode that's just as semantically rich uh, as what we're able to do with our, our uh, primary communication channel. Um, so that's called multimodal communication. It's one of the things that only we seem to be able to do. Another one is to embed and recurse over long sequences, and this is not just with language, but with all kinds of uh, you know, symbols, um, but allows us to say things like, this is the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built, and you can understand that perfectly well, even if you've never heard that sentence before. And this re leads to what uh, von Humboldt called the infinite use of finite means, which means that we might have a limited number of sort of atoms that we can use to communicate with, but with those, we have an infinite number of messages that, that we can produce. Um, and we don't see that, as far as we know, yet in the, in the animal kingdom. Um, I'm going to wrap up here in about two minutes. Uh, but so it's these three things. Uh, this is the Hauser and, and uh, Chomsky and Fisk paper here that I was talking about. That's from about 2003 or so. You can read more on that there. Um, just one quote I pulled out of there. Uh, we, must, uh, we must thus conclude that the immediate ancestor of modern humans possessed a brain that had, for whatever reason, evolved to a point where a single developmental change or genetically related group of changes was sufficient to create a structure with an entirely new potential. Uh, which is very interesting because for some reason we have evolved, we evolved not too long ago into this creature that does all these weird communicative things that we do now, and we don't really know why. Um, so I was going to go uh, on for a bit here about pragmatics, but I don't want to take up too much time. Um, pragmatics is a, a field of study in communication um, that is an area that uh, AI still has made very little progress in. So we have um, you know, speech recognition things. We have natural language understanding. You can say, you know, hey, Alexa, you know, what's the weather today? And Alexa will say, uh, you know, it's going to be 70 degrees or whatever. Uh, or you can say, you know, Siri, do I need my umbrella? And she'll tell you if you do or not. But if you say, uh, Siri, where is my umbrella? Uh, you probably won't really get the answer that you're looking for. Um, and part of the reason for that is we still don't have a good way to operationalize what we call pragmatics, which is just knowing uh, you know, what things mean in the right context. So here, if you can't read it, he's saying, uh, tell the men to move out. Why, sir? The rents are too high, right? So he's, he's understood the words right, but he's got the context wrong. Uh, and um, you know, the point there is we don't usually understand each other just by the meanings of the words by themselves. There are lots of situational things that, that come to play. Um, there's a great example of that from Herb Clark here at Stanford, uh, who uh, had this uh, quote in one of his books where he said, uh, Max went too far and teapotted a policeman today. Um, now, his point is that we don't know what teapotted means here, but this is a perfectly sensible English question. Uh, and if you and I know a guy named Max and he makes uh, ceramic teapots, then you know, I could just be saying to you, oh, Max went and you know, maybe for some reason I'm outraged about this, that he went too far. Uh, but even though you don't understand necessarily the semantics that those words are supposed to have, it's a perfectly sensible and understandable uh, English sentence. Um, this is important in enterprise organizations um, because they need an AI 
that can interpret signals within the context of their business and with the context of their business environment. Um, and the context that business run in are multifarious. There are social factors, market factors, uh, you know, financial factors. All these things are constantly changing. And when the, these things are changing, the things that uh, the, the, the meanings of words and the you know the meanings that they're being used in uh, are also constantly changing. So machines that don't understand these things and aren't built with these things in mind uh, are going to have troubles with with these types of things. Uh, so. These are the kinds of things that, uh, you know, at, at Loop, for example, we're working on uh, basically an oper operationalization of pragmatics that goes into uh, every machine that we lease out right now uh, and allows machines, to, uh, organizations to have a machine with a cognitive computing platform um, that really understands, uh, you know, what their uh, words mean within their context. Whoops, it's going to go back one and leave it on the... Leave it on the thing with our slide there. Um, but anyway, I'll stop there. Um, thanks very much. All right, thank you. All right, well, I would love for the rest of the panelists to introduce yourselves. Thanks for having us. Um, thanks for taking precious time in your evening to be here. Um, H2O is a grassroots movement of data scientists, mathematicians, machine learners, physicists, and uh, software engineers, compiler engineers. Um, trying to build world-class algorithms and deliver it to your hands at scale and make it easy and make data science, AI, faster, cheaper, and easier to do. Right? Sort of the fundamental challenge right now we have, a um, couple of fundamental challenges we have with AI right now is one, trust in AI, and the skill ga skills uh, gap and talent gap in doing AI. I think uh, our new generation of products are are now kind of helping that even make it faster, cheaper, easier. But building explainable, understandable AI so you can trace through it, debug it, when it goes wrong, um, so you can prevent the next AI uh, disaster slash winter. Uh, AI has been with us for a long time, um, and I feel kind of really uh, uh, quite fortunate to be, to be amongst uh, folks who, are, who, who joined the mission of building a grassroots movement and then making AI ubiquitous. Um, six years ago, when we were, when I started the company, not uh, almost a few blocks from here, I called it 386 Gates because I started in the Gates Building in Stanford, and um, I, I mean, the community of Stanford came by, helped me build world-class machine learning algorithms, and then uh, not far from there, Sand Hill Road, um, Jishnu met me in a, a Starbucks on Sharon Heights and, and uh, decided to be the seed investor for uh, the vision that became H2O. And many years later now, uh, about 14,000 companies use H2O today, uh, and um, more than 150,000 uh, data scientists use it every day to do data. Uh, and now you're proliferated into lots of organizations and applications and edge, and now uh, with, with, with power by, now with help from N NVIDIA and IBM, we're able to take it to even mass markets. I think AI is still a very infant stage, a lot of hype around AI, but I think uh, AI is a software movement fundamentally. Science doesn't scale, software does. And so uh, in transforming science to software, we've really uh, been putting a lot of energy into kind of giving you code from data. So essentially you can scale at the pace at which data is coming. And uh, that's kind of fundamentally where our next-gen products, driverless AI, which automates most of the machine learning and automatic machine learning is going. But long, long end of the vision here is how do we make AI ubiquitous? Every edge, every processor on the edge, every device will be billions of devices will have AI embedded in them. So then the world can really allow us to focus on feeling. And I think that's kind of one of the things he was touching is what do humans really good at? I mean, and how do we feel and get that kind of um, a next level of ability and time to invest in things that make us happier. Um, so thanks for being here, and I'm really excited for a wonderful evening. Right, thank you. Shubo? Um, I'm Shubo. I work in Facebook AI research. Um, thank you for inviting me to the panel. Um, so Facebook AI Research, we are a very academic lab inside of Facebook. We, um, uh, we work in pretty much every discipline of AI, including um, computer vision, natural language processing, speech, reinforcement learning, which I work on, um, uh, optimization, uh, causal inference, like pretty much anything you can, you can think of, we work on. 
Um, we are very academic in the sense that everything we do, we publish, um, every data set, every paper. Um, we open source code a lot. Um, there is literally, I think, nothing we do that is not out in the open. Uh, my background, so what I work on now, I've, I've been there for about a year and on change. Um, I've mainly been working on reinforcement learning during that time. Um, before that, I was working uh, at Baidu Silicon Valley iLab, building up uh, Deep Speech and Deep Speech 2, which are very standard speech recognition neural networks. Also uh, worked on speech synthesis before that, uh, at that same time. Um, and my background is uh, actually, it started up doing computer graphics for films, um, and then from there I moved into uh, general um, high performance computing, which, le which led me to AI because AI uses a lot of compute. Um, thank you. Hi, I'm Jishnu Bhattacharji, Managing Director at Nexus Venture Partners. So, we are an early stage focused venture capital firm managing about $1.5 billion, and we invest in US and India. Um, uh, you know, as they always say that. You know, uh, man is known by the company he keeps. I say that, you know, VC is known by the company he or she gets to work with, and I'm fortunate to be working with entrepreneurs like Sri. Um, we, we come in at very early stage, um, uh, Series A, but we also do seed investments. Often, you know, companies, often entrepreneurs, not only just pre-revenue, but, but also pre-product and often pre-PowerPoint, as was the case with Sri. Uh, and uh, you know, talking about about AI, uh, uh, of course, you know, here as much as I would like to share two cents, but much more I'm I'm learning from the esteemed panelists and all of you. Uh, what from my lens, what we look at is that you know what what nuggets of AI can be used in applications that is usable today in the industries and and to kind of move every day everyday life. And many cases, I find that you know, the boundaries like, like one can possibly argue where, where ML, where statistics ends, ML starts, AI begins, you know, it's like everywhere. Sometimes we feel that, you know, looking, sitting at, on, the, on one side of the table and hearing a lot of pitches, we sometimes, you know, scratch our head on, you know, out of the 95%, 99% pitches which has AI, you know, how much there is AI or not, but at the end of the day, the core that we look for is that you know how science is being used to better people's lives. So, and anything that that we can be part of, uh, we feel to to kind of like you know have an impact there. We feel fortunate. Speaking so. of bettering lives, so I want to know what the panel thinks about where you think AI currently has the highest ROI when it comes to business applications. Start on this side. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, well, uh, I, I, you know, there are, especially in large organizations, lots of inefficiencies, inefficiencies that are already going on, and AI just has huge potential to, uh, you know, close that gap in the in the inefficiencies. Um, you know, one one of the things that um, you know we end up working a lot in sort of the customer service area. Uh, we, we we tend to focus uh, lately mostly on sort of fintech and insurance companies and stuff like that. Um, but places where you know you've got customer representatives who. Um, you know, even if they have good search tools, they end up doing a lot of sort of you know information handling in in a way that uh, you know really makes them. Uh, not an unnecessary middleman, but a middleman who has to do a lot more middle person than has to do a lot more work than uh, you would really want them to do. You can make these people a lot more efficient by um, you know putting in cognitive computing sort of principles and robotic proce process automation and, and that sort of thing, and um, you know really making people much more efficient. Um, on top of that, we have you know signals coming from I call them signals, but you know. Uh, information that's contained in all kinds of different legacy systems that ha has a, is a goldmine of information of what is going on in your organization across different parts of the organization and then throughout different systems. Um, 
And you know, up until now, it's been too big of a job for people to really just come in and you know, look at all of that, unless you really have the money that you want to hire a management consultant team to you know, go through all these different legacy systems types, types of data um, and gain insights from them. Um, but this is something that we can now do uh, you know, fairly simply with a cognitive computing appliance. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so for us, that's one area that we've seen a huge, uh, you know, potential for big Right. ROI. So Patrick is saying that you guys should all go out and build your versions of Autodesk's Ava, right? <laughs> that's one thing you could do. Yeah. 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 So Shri, you said 14,000 companies use H2O. So which one of them is making the most money off of your platform? <laughs> yeah, I hope a lot of them, right? Yeah. Sort of, um, there's a lot of startups which actually, um, over the last year, maybe thousand. It's about 3,000 startups um, that have actually embedded H2O inside. Um, but I think uh, um, capital markets, I mean, um, you, you're going to see dramatic transformation in capital markets, um, uh, especially now we can build automatic time series models to predict exactly how, um, the, how, what the spreads you can look at to kind of how many of a particular item will be sold in a, per, in a, in a particular Costco. How many TVs will be sold in a Costco? To how many washing machines? Uh, based on different events that are happening, so, a, so retail will be transformed. Uh, insurance life uh, mortality prediction is a very uh, one of uh, one of the uh, core investors behind the company. In the uh, second later stage are life insurance companies mm. looking to enhance uh, life. Um, they're uh, motivated to make us healthier, and so uh, health is a. Is, a, is, is wealth and, and, and protecting health, um, making sure we can actually give the best um, saving lives. That's a lot of use cases in, uh, in saving lives. And so the most companies um, are predicting sepsis across 160 hospitals in the United States. Uh, automatic ER, whether to send to ICU or not, uh, to kind of uh, predicting um, whether uh, someone's more susceptible to organ um, Failure, um, so, so kind of the really powerful use cases there. How many flu shots should be should a Walgreens hold uh, mm -hmm. in, in on University Avenue? Right, so literally predicting block by block um, uh, how that goes. But then we see next stage. We see a lot of um, use cases in finance, of course, mm -hmm. democratizing credit because in the subprime space, uh, credit is really uh, the, the credit scores are really bust, and so rebuilding those models continuously, automatically, and making sure credit is available when you need it. Uh, education, I think if you think about the most value that we can give to the world, we're here in Stanford, is to make education even more, um, both uh, e easier, conducive, the right curriculum for the right person. Personalized education is kind of where we see a much bigger uh, aha likely to happen. Real estate, really corner case, but you would say, uh, but figuring out how to make any an office space more conducive to a good, good, uh, to good culture. How do you dis design good office spaces? To how do you uh, price different uh, spaces? So you're seeing valuation, prediction of valuation, and uh, pricing. Booking.com uses us to predict pri predict um, which hotel you, you would probably stay and and what price the hotel can give you. eBay is automatic doing automatic categorization of of products on their website using machine learning and deep so learning. Speaking, so speaking of, of price <laughs> prediction, though, I'm curious, have you tried to analyze Bitcoin prices with your time series product? <laughs> because I'm sure the audience would like some price predictions on where the crypto market's going. I, I think we, we couldn't predict uh, Bitcoin pricing, but we can definitely predict that between Bitcoin and AI, the NVIDIA stock price has definitely gone up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Jishno, is there a type of AI company you're most excited to invest in right now you think has the most potential for business ROI? So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, any day, any day, I, I know, I, I would only know when I get to see it, and whenever I get to see it, I would only hope that nobody else has seen it so that, you know, I can fund. <laughs> now, um, you know, some of the, going back to your, to your uh, original question of impact on AI, you know, one of the, one of the beauty of being, you know, uh, associated with the platform AI company is that, you know, we get to see huge amount of use cases, and I have learned a lot through the use cases that H2O's customers are seeing. I wanted to put, you know, some, some uh, shed some, some lights on some of the other use cases in, I would say, day-to-day -day enterprise life. Like, you know, you talk about any enterprise cares for customer service, you know, procurement, uh, sales process, marketing. Each and every functionalities you talk about are being relooked 
and you know to some extent reimagined using AI, of course with the objective of making it not only like making it more efficient, making things faster and better and reducing kind of like you know human proneness to error, but also enabling use cases which was not possible before. I mean, you know, today, you know, we can do very different things in this, you know, huge, I would say, you know, trillion dollar industries, you know, health, uh, transportation, retail, which were simply not possible before because you can't be do, pay, put in rule-based systems into things which you don't even know or which you don't, you do, can't even ask what questions you would ask to get an answer. So these are the things, you know, AI can come in where, you know, they can let you do a lot of things which was not possible before. And I feel another beauty of AI, why it has potential for a lot of ROI is that if you look at traditional software, how they have been built or how they have been applied to different use cases is that you have to go in, understand the specific nuances of that use case and then codify the workflow into that code with the logic based on whatever you could observe, and that's what you can serve. The beauty of AI is that at the end of the day, the AI brain can be adapted based on what you are feeding it. AI brain can be adapted to huge amount of use cases, I'm sure, you know, at- Including at, in continents, remember? <laughs> <laughs> like in H2O, when H2O was built and the core engine was built, not necessarily from day one, we are thinking of it will be used in real estate or it will be used in health, but we are learning from how people have taken the same AI engine to all these places are and are being able to build use cases which are relevant for them. And that I think is the beauty here because we, we hear talk about digitization of the industries. Previously it was more of lip service in my mind because it needed huge amount of con contextualization and efforts in software building because you have to know everything and codify. But AI really enables digitization of industries like it was not ever possible before. And that's the excitement, I think. Yeah, so I just want to mention that if you do have a question for the panel, we're going to be taking audience questions later. So just text your, um, your question to 650-308-8522. That's 650-308-8522. I'll get it on my iPad here and I'll be able to ask the panelists later. So Shubai, I want to get your opinion because AI does work in many use cases, but there's also certain types of AI that's currently just in an R&D stage right now. It's just too far field, too experimental, too academic for day-to-day -day use or enterprise use. What are some of the use cases that you think AI is just too experimental for right now? Um, I, can, I think you can pick anything that is considered solved and um, you can find use cases where it will not work. For example, I used to work in speech recognition um, we can do pretty good speech recognition for single speaker short utterances, but uh, anything beyond that, like a panel like this, it will completely fail. Um, same thing with translation. We can, like some of the text that you are showing, we can, well, it's not really translation, but uh, in translation, you can translate short snippets fairly well, factual snippets fairly well. Um, doesn't work in, in prose or when there is some pun or idiom or anything like that. Um, generation is generation and summarization, which are like <laughs> two sides of the same coin in some sense. Um, um, we can't summarize very well. We can't generate beyond like maybe a paragraph um, very well. Um, and, and say, uh, moving into vision, for example, we can do um, uh, like you take, take an uh, uh, image of something, like say this water bottle here. I can say it's a water bottle, but uh, if I take this picture from here, sitting here, and I tell a human to describe a scene, the human is going to say, oh, there's an audience listening to some talk or something like that. But if I give it to an AI algorithm, so to speak, they, they might start identifying that's a person, that's a person, that's a person, that's a person. And mm -hmm. you know, that's not kind of what we want. So um, getting higher level semantic understanding from images or video or, um, is hard. Um, and, and that's kind of um, uh, like solving those will, will bring in kind of the next um, level of um, applications. Um, also good predictive modeling. So um, in, if I show you a clip um, of, say, of any event that's going on, say a soccer match or whatever, since it's World Cup right now, um, you can probably say where the ball is going to go. You can kind of have a prediction. Um, I don't know of any good predict. I mean, this is, again, very, idea uh, very active research is how does how do you, like we have very good predictive models of the world um, mm -hmm. that we build from very few examples, um, a, a, like from a baby. Um, like babies learn by rolling in, in almost, like by crawling around, but 
uh, and they build this predictive model, like if I pull this thing, what's going to happen next? Um, there, there is no neural network that, that'll do it. So those are all, um, like starting from something that you think are solved, but the, the use cases are kind of just beyond. It, it fails like right over the edge and to the, um, to the really researchy stuff where you actually want to build predictive models of the world, where you have notions of physics that we have uh, inside of us. So that's kind of the spectrum, I think. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear from the rest of the panel, what is the funniest AI fail that you guys have come across? <laughs> Funny AI fails. So I'll start with one. So I bought, I, so I love conversational interfaces, and I bought this Hello Barbie toy from Mattel, which is this talking toy. And so it uses a little bit of NLP to respond to you. Um, but it does, because it's a children's toy, it has to come with a restricted corpus. And Barbie, of course, is obsessed with you know, fashion and shopping. So Barbie says, you know, Maria, what do you want to be when you grow up? I say, Barbie, I want to be an AI designer. Barbie says, oh, you want to be a fashion designer. So Barbie doesn't think I have a real job. So AI fail. Um, any other AI fails? We have some internal um, kind of research projects where we are trying to look at. Um, I, I, can give, like, I can't give examples, but these the fails where the text generation based on image, when they, when they go off the rails, it's like, oh, yeah. it's, it's very much along the lines. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. We, um, so we built um, this generative network. We challenged branding agencies to do st a startup naming competition. And so we trained this recurrent neural network on 50,000 startup names and descriptions and just had it generate like random startup names, some of which like seemed really plausible, but they were just like, they were like AI powered meals on the blockchain or something. It's like almost, almost feasible. It's almost feasible. It's almost like so insane. It's, it's Silicon Valley, right? So text generation is a, is a hoot. So uh, I would like to go to the next question, which is a lot of companies want to use AI. They want to be effective with AI, but Adopting AI the way that Facebook does it, or the way that H2O does it, or the way that Loop.ai does it, or the way that your companies that you want to invest in do it, is actually really difficult. So what have you observed have been the biggest barriers to entry with regard to adopting AI at an enterprise scale? Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, we, we, we face that all the time when uh, we get, you know, sort of upper management that's, you know, wants to get on the AI train and, uh, you know, they're willing to allocate resources to it and bring us in. And, um, you know, a lot of times we work with uh, strategic partners like Deloitte or Accenture or somebody. And, uh, and then, you know, you, you sort of get to the level of implementation where you're, you know, dealing not with the executives anymore, but, you know, the people who are actually doing the work in the company. And, uh, and suddenly you realize that there are all these, all these barriers in the form of, you know, legacy systems and data formats. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, people, uh, at, at the management level, worried that they're now involved in something that is going to make them, you know, uh, replaceable now, um, and you know, because of that, we we focus a lot of the time. I mean, our our system really is designed to help people, not to replace people, and to make them more efficient and to allow them to spend less time doing the sort of drudgery. advantageous to to them um, so there's that and then there's just um, you know the the fact that data is coming from all kinds of different systems that you you know who knows how old those systems necessarily are they're coming coming from multifarious systems uh, or they've already implemented like let's say IBM Watson to do this and they've got the Salesforce Einstein doing that and stuff and um, now you need to deal with you know different formats of data coming in all from all kinds of different directions um, so so that is a, a challenge and um, you know we've sort of designed our system um, to make it so it can learn as much as it can just from data in all kinds of different formats well, without you really having to spend too much time, you know, waste too much time on, you know, reforming, reforming it in whatever 
you know, because if you need everything like dumped into a CSV file or it has to come through Hadoop or something like that, then um, you know, it's going <laughs> it's to be a nightmare for the people who <laughs> are going to have to work on it. Yeah. Yeah. So Shri, what are some of your top customer complaints? Like when they're trying to use H2O but they can't get it to work or it doesn't quite solve their problem, what are some of the failure modes that you have observed? Well, first of all, um, feedback is uh, more, more is, is precious, right? Sort of feedback is exactly why we open source our product and get it into a lot of hands and, and improve. So uh, almost, I mean, you talked about, AI, you asked about AI failures. I mean, the AI successes are actually countable, right? Sort of we see AI fail most of the time. Um, right. So it's kind of the almost the opposite. And it's um, usually not funny. Just to set times, expectations, your AI will fail. How many times has Siri <laughs> failed for you? Well, I mean, a lot of times, right? So then it gets better, right? So that's how data. Um, so we see, I mean, customers have data challenges, right? So 80, the 80 20 rule of 80% time spent doing data and then 20% doing the algorithms part, um, that has now become 98 too, right? Because algorithms have gotten faster and more smarter. Not having enough data or the right data is, is still a very big challenge that holds back people. Not having good skills, um, um, skilled modelers, right, sort of who are not uh, getting uh, into common pitfalls like overfitting or uh, common day-to-day uh, -day issues like leakage between test and train, um, and then deploying those models into production. How do you take them and put them into an application? How do you build inference engines that can run on the edge or that can run inside the application? That's still a, the end-to-end -end life cycle, getting the model development life cycle. Uh, just like the software development life cycle, all of these challenges are still the day-to-day -day challenges. Um, in terms of software and how H2O, the complaints specifically against H2O and our products, uh, customers are like the children of a startup, right? Sort of, and um, the children expect excellence from their parents, and and that's the customers demand excellence, right? So that's roughly how we see it, and so they're continuously uh, the, the 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 notion of of a of a perpetually unhappy customer is absolute is absolute, and I think Jeff Bezos talks about it, and it's absolutely true, and and the customers are. Once you get it 10 times faster, they want it to be next level, faster, accurate, interpretable. So they, they, they want to then understand why that local decision was made this way by AI. So you can, they want to learn and get the intuition around these black box models. But how do you, uh, this, mo this model decided that I need to buy these things or price these things or, de or define my marketing budget this way. They want to then break that down and say, how did this intelligent thing uh, come to this conclusion, and and can I do, can I trust it? I think that's still a very big uh, okay. uh, challenge for markets. Regulators okay. have questions around these before they get deployed, and thousands of people either uh, progress or not make progress. Uh, and those are the challenges that uh, customers are are trying to come together to help us in some sense to build a model, build modeling software that they can trust and go go to go to market with, go to business with. That's still. Um, and typical challenges are around how do you get this to work on at, in a cluster of machines, or do you get this to work on and before we can before we can get adapted to the clusters. GPU clusters have come along. They want to now understand how it goes on GPUs or TPUs and cloud. So the, the AI is coming together at a time when uh, the rest of the ecosystem of microservices and server serverless computing is coming together. Mm -hmm. And so there's a decent transformation that's happening. Uh, business process optimization is fundamentally why one should adopt AI. And so business process optimization, which is kind of, Patrick touches on it, is it is disruptive. Uh, what will humans do in, when, when learning is no longer the most prized item or knowledge is no longer the most prized item? How does, what is my role in the context of an AI-enabled enterprise? Mm -hmm. I think that's a reasonable challenge customers have. But I think they're, uh, they're coming to grips with the situation that automatic um, does, and flying doesn't mean we, we, we do less, we'll do more. Mm -hmm. and, and how do I ask more difficult questions? Uh, imagination is still the fundamentally scarce. Imagination, courage, if I had to put two things that are, are the fundamentally more scarce resources in the world. And if we could now, AI can be a very powerful partner for people with big imagination, purpose, and seeking data, if you have data, you can build something that is meaningful, and that return on uh, emotions, not just return on investment. Yeah. And that's roughly where customers are 
grasping. So speaking of scarce resources, Shuba, we know that AI researchers are like millions of dollars a year now, and so they are very expensive and very different, difficult to hire, and that is creating a barrier for companies that want to innovate in AI but can't quite find the talent. So what are some of your thoughts on the AI recruiting landscape? Um, I, I, talent landscape is very, very challenging, um, e even for us. Um, but you know, as technology matures, it kind of you know it dissipates, right? Now, now you can get best of breed like image recognition or speech um, uh, transcription or like translation APIs right from like Google or Amazon or any of the leading cloud vendors. Um, so, in some sense, you don't have to like build those models kind of yourself. Right, you can just say, "Oh, I've got an API in the cloud. I can I can just use uh, to do whatever I want to do." So, in, in that sense, you maybe you don't even need that those people. Should but, people just give up? Should they give up on hiring researchers and just I use mean, an API? There, I think, I think the, if you if you if you have to hire, I, I think you have to take like a kind of a dumbbell strategy where you either hire a very senior person who hasn't had a lot of AI experience but is willing to learn and and. Um, like a lot of AI is actually, or uh, is in some sense, engineering, right? There's a, the research part of AI where I kind of work in, where we are looking at different neural networks and whether it will work or not. Like I don't even know. And the other thing is, oh, I just need a, a ResNet, and I just need to change this thing of ResNet to classify instead of water bottles, I don't know, the machine parts, for example, right? I mean, that's much more of an engineering challenge. Um, and that you may be able to get somebody who is very senior and willing to learn, or you can get somebody who is, you know, is, is, is an undergrad and had like now the course you have better materials now as well, right? So you have you, you have these courses that machine machine learning used to be. So I, I went to Stanford uh, in Stanford Stats, where uh, machine learning used to be this very hard subject and that you only did in grad school, but now you have it filtering down into. Uh, undergrad. I think Andrew's class is now 800 people or something like that, um, which is you know. Middle, middle school. <laughs> mid, mid, it's true. It's like a, it's like a waiting like, list to get into <laughs> some of these AI classes here at Stanford. Um, so. Now that AI is becoming more prolific, there, it is easier sometimes to get these AI products out the door. Now we have all kinds of companies saying that they use AI, like some of the examples that I gave in my introductory presentation. So Jishnu, I was wondering, I'm sure you get pitched almost every day, hundreds of companies, they say, oh, we're using the state of the art, machine learning, whatever, whatever. How do you call bullshit? Like, What are some good tips that you can share with the audience to help them suss out whether somebody's legitimately doing AI or they're like some adult diaper company masquerading as an AI company. Yeah. So, so you know, in, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's sometimes funny that, you know, in, in our, our job, like, you know, we are like um, just, a, just a, a background to that. Like, if 10, last 10 years of my, of my busy career, if I look at, like, you know, often, you know, peaches, if I just classify the peaches, they follow the technology trends. I can clearly see that, you know, when I, 10 years ago, every peach will have cloud. Then it moved to big data. Then it moved to AIML. Now AIML blockchain and, and all that kind of, and it's, it's like pretty much in line with like the Gartner hype cycles and all those things, you know, as you can, as you can see. Now, for, for us actually, what is critically important is that, you know, as much as we see, of course, you know, we would like to understand whether the technology is, you know, whether there is meat in what is being talked about. But critically important is our confidence in the person who is coming in and talking about building it. So in a sense that, you know, a lot of things because, I mean, yes, I mean, we would like to get to a point that at least we would like to, you know, appreciate what is being talked about and infer whether there is something real out here or not. But more than getting into the nitty gritty, at least, you know, that's, I'm talking about my style, nitty gritty is of, the details of the type of neural nets or you know the kind of uh, layers being used and whether it is real or not i would like to form an opinion on whether that particular person who is talking about do they really know what they're talking about and how i guess you, you know how do you tell though right so, like, how do you tell cuz it's like yeah. sometimes you can just throw some technical jargon in there Correct. and like and then and then through. it definitely so how helps do you tell? and then the it, it, it definitely it definitely <laughs> Definitely helps to to have partnered with a company like H2O. <laughs> so if, I, if I'm not, if I'm stuck onto something, I have people to ask whether there is 
anything real or not. So I think after a certain point, you definitely need some sort of expert opinion on expert eyes. And that you would usually go in when you are reasonably serious that you want to take it to the next stage. Mm -hmm. And you know, it is, I mean, today, you know, I mean, very, very few of the companies which are pitching AI, you know, do they really, really have any, you know, real AI. Yeah. Very few. What about the rest of you guys? What's your sanity check? Like if someone's like, oh, I have this AI company. And I was just thinking. You know, what are like the um, one or two questions you use to call them out? Yeah, one of our first meetings with a potential investor, they brought in their technical due diligence guy who uh, was a physics PhD and published some papers on like quantum phenomena around black holes. <laughs> and um, so we started talking about a little bit about the math as much as we could say about how our system worked. And, uh, and then he asked me, he said, uh, so is that a closed manifold? And I was like, uh, I have to think about that one. I might have to go look up my tensor calculus book. Um, but yeah, if you can get a guy with a PhD in like quantum black hole physics stuff, then uh, I suppose they could ask you some, some deep dive questions like that. But for the most part, you know, uh, the, the AI that people are doing this day, these days, um, you know, don't require really that level of knowledge about, for example, tensor calculus. And, uh, you know, for just the, the knowledge that people have gained over the past couple of years by, you know, using TensorFlow and watching tutorials and all that sort, sort of thing, um, you know, has, has led to a huge increase in uh, ability of people to, to do AI, even if it's just sort of, you know, an, an engineering thing mm -hmm. now. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I would suspect that, I'm, I'm not in the VC world, but I would suspect that it really is more often about the idea and the viability of the idea than you know the uniqueness of the technology that's behind it, unless they're really claiming to do something, um, you know, that, state of the that, art. that yeah. seems completely new and you've never <laughs> heard of it before. In which case, you should probably really be suspicious and then you know look Maybe into. Maybe you their should ask Shubo to review. So Shubo, I know you review Dex, um, <laughs> and if somebody's saying I'm doing some state of the art AI, how? What's your red flags for finding out whether they're doing something actually innovative? Yeah, so I'm not a VC, but imagine in a world where I was a VC and somebody came, I am, I am using AI to do this. Uh, it's almost like somebody coming and said, I'm using electricity to do this. Like, AI is like a tool. I mean, I think VCs, I, I don't know how you do it. Like, VCs are more interested in like, what problem are you trying to solve? Or like, are you solving a problem 10x more efficient or cheaper or whatever that is? Like, what, if you're actually using AI, I, I almost think that it should be a, you should not even say it. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to your question, how do you suss it out? It's like, I mean, being in research lab, we kind of know like what is possible. Like we know what what are the state of the art result in classification, segmentation, um, and state of the art result in translation, generation. Like all the basic tasks we know, mm -hmm. right? If somebody comes in and says, I I can build a robot that I can put it in any room like here, and I can point to the robot, go out, and the robot will go out. I know that's not possible. Okay. I mean, there's a fundamental. So the, the answer that, I mean, is that you need to ask Shubo if you're ever wondering about the <laughs> Shubo's um, spoken like a real physicist, yeah. right? So, so, uh, so I, I was kind of half, uh -huh. half yeah. hoping Patrick was not being stumped by one of our own black hole theorists. And so we, we actually have uh, collected physicists wherever we can get them, right? Sort of. Uh, physics folks have been thinking of these problems of big data, large data, high dimensional data sets, sparse data sets for a long time. So essentially, uh, at the core of our company, is essentially a black hole theorist with 100 papers, John McKinney, Arno Kendall, Stanford Linear Accelerator, physics folks who have been doing this for a long time, grandmasters, um, Kaggle is a great place to find good talent. You have still talent last time. Of course, you start with a great talent initial pool and then the rest of other talent follows them. That's one of the things. If you start with Shubo, you get a lot more talent around him. Right? So that's how you get. But I think, to, to, to his point, to his credit, I think AI, is, all companies, all software is going to, is using AI. That's what's happening around us, right? Sort of, and all hardware is now also following the workloads. And so AI is, is, is stable stakes. And so it's really, what are you doing with it? That's where the imagination kicks in. And how bold are you with that? How long are you willing to go through the forest? Uh, that's roughly the questions that probably matter. Yeah. AI is a table stakes, uh, and a lot of automatic machine learning is out there, APIs out there. Uh, but physics, uh, I would say, if I was a young uh, researcher again, I would just say more physics and more uh, theoretical neuroscience, theoretical statistical thinking. Um, statistical thinking is actually hard. 
And then, and once, once. That's what I was just about to say. Is the, that seems to me like the the one skill that is the most important for machine learning is having a real good foundation in statistics. And when you see AI going wrong, it's when people are mm -hmm. doing a lot of AI Feel techniques, nods, so. but not thinking about the statistics. Need to review of the your data. college statistics book if you haven't cracked that open in a while. Yeah. Right. yeah. I, I would say math is job math. security. Math. Like being good at math is, math job, is security. job security. Math is job security. All right. <laughs> Open those math books too, y'all. Linear algebra, <laughs> calculus, better get at it. So you said that imagination is very important. And so now I want to test your imagination. I want to know that if you guys were to start a company today, brand new, where would you start it and why? Where are you really seeing the most potential value that no one else is doing yet? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's uh, you know, um, I, I'm pretty happy with the company we have now. And when we see opportunities, we just try to angle our, our current company into taking advantage of that. Um, but I do think that where we're going to see huge changes is in uh, conversational AI, you know, which let's, let's face it, right now, like uh, AI can do some neat tricks in conversation, but as your, as your Barbie doll kind of showed, they're, they're really just parlor tricks. And it's, it's akin to, there, there's this famous old horse called Clever Hans that uh, his owner said he'd trained it to do math. And you'd you know, show it a three and a five, and it would stomp its foot eight times. And uh, it was apparently you know, somewhat mathematically sophisticated for a horse. Um, and then they found out that it was basically some you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Be uh, behavior, behaviorist uh, principles that went into teaching this horse, uh, you know, when you see this, like stomp eight times and, and stuff like that. Uh, and conversational AI is really not that far beyond clever Hans uh, right now. That's true. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we still don't understand, as I was kind of getting out with the pragmatics, we still don't understand what understanding means um, and how to operationalize our experience of understanding something so that we can instantiate that into a machine. Um, but I think that we're getting really close, uh, at least on a theoretical level, um, to understanding that much better than we used to. Mm -hmm. All right, Sri. Oh, I'll probably ask. Your 30-second elevator pitch, come on. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably ask the, uh, I'm curious to I'm hear what Jishnu has to say. I'm going to ask him to pick his favorite at the end, yes, so. Yes, so I'm curious to see what Jishnu has to say on that. Uh, H2O is actually just still very young, so I'm, I'm fully like immersed in so building let's, that let's large community. So let's just imagine that you'd never and, started and so H2O. So the lack of imagination there is quite uh, <laughs> obvious. Um, <laughs> but but to, be, to be honest, I think um, the value chain is really um, shifted to um, both the humans, of course, um, because if you have a bold, um, bold idea, you can now start using AI as your co-founder, right? Um, data is still a very powerful problem. I mean, so it's a few companies in the world, some unnamed, own most of the data in the world, and so uh, and 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 actually, and they are being hijacked, to be honest. And 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 I don't, I don't think data um, data is like a, uh, it's 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 a personal property. Or it's your property, and so the civil rights movement for data is on the verge of happening where if you are part of that event, you need to own that data as well. And making that, in, the, in, the, in, in your, I would take my jewels, or, or I don't have jewels, but uh, I'd put them in the bank and safeguard my most precious uh, things were things I owned. But I think in the ownerless economy we are now in, or rented economy, uh, we call it, uh, we're now beginning to make sure data becomes so important. And I think uh, the company that imagines how to uh, personalize your data, protect it with it through blockchain or whatever other techniques, create a real currency with which you get rich because of your data, not the companies that you worked with um, that can take over your data. And I think that's uh, a whole turning the coin upside down where data becomes a universal uh, property or your own property. You choose to allow how it's used by others and which, if you want to make Alzheimer's better, fix Alzheimer's, or, um, or, or muscular dystrophy, or other problems, you get the chance to have a say. And I think that kind of next level of, thing, of democratizing data and democratizing AI has happened. AI is now an open, open AI movement. Even large companies now believe in open source and AI. I think the open data movement is right around the corner, and I think that's something, it's, a, it's an idea waiting to be picked up, and and executed on, and I think democratizing ownership, that's the last thing to really, I think the way uh, 
the way our economy is structured is that it is an inequality is a side effect of our of success and i think we need to change that so that the social construct on which we are standing uh, can actually sustain and i think what we are talking about right now is essentially a completely imbalanced uh, uh, economy and and i think uh, the the social movements we have should be able to sustain a much more equal world and i think that's something that we are seeing uh, at risk and so if i'm an entrepreneur today starting i would start trying to address those issues as possible. So we have conversational AI, basically individual data agency. Now, Shuba, what's your startup pitch? Uh, I, I'm like the, the most anti-entrepreneur probably here. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I've only worked in academic and industrial research labs, and all I do is like publish papers. Um, I, I like to... Um, if, I'm if, very jealous, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I like to see is like where, where you have, we have very mature ways of looking at images and classifying them or, or, or like saying this is in this image. And um, you want to pair that ability to, with industries that are very, um, very old school, not e efficient. And I don't like, like some of the things that come to mind obviously are like medicine is one, but there probably are others. Uh, as well, like factory floors or another, where, and we can put cameras like everywhere in some sense these days very cheaply. Um, so, you know, if I had to, like, and I haven't, obviously, you can, as you can see, I have not really deeply thought about it, but essentially taking industries that are very inefficient and taking technologies that are almost mature and, and finding out where the applications of that technology are in those industries is where, where I would start if I had to uh, uh, give a pitch. Yeah. I just knew you get to play entrepreneur now. So if you started a company in the AI space, what would it be? Yeah. So, you know, I was, I was, you started with your original premise was, you know, how imaginative people are. What I look for is, can I be, can I connect with imaginative people first? And, and in general, of course, you know, I wish you know, I were that imaginative, then probably like, you know, I would have, I would have gone into start, try and start something rather than, you know, uh, and I said that, you know, if you can't, if you can't, create history by being imaginative, then at least you know, try to be part of one and back one. So having said that, I think if my, my uh, world of view is that I would like to go in and address huge problems which are really big and can have huge impact. So two areas that come to my mind, and of course you know, it's also driven by a lot of, lot of activities uh, we are seeing here, and still there are so much un, untapped potential. One is logistics and transportation. Like it's, it's uh, you know, both go hand in hand. The other is health, and both are multi-trillion dollar industries worldwide. And as a firm, we invest both in US and India, and we get to see different, different uh, economies evolving at different, different uh, pace, you know, with, with different kind of constraints. So very interesting. So to give you an example, like, you know, you talk about logistics and transportation. Like as is, if you are taking, say, UPS or FedEx systems, from here and put it into India, it will fail. It, it will be dead on arrival. And you know, many, many. There are many, many reasons. Some of the some of the most kind of obviously quoted ones, but it's very difficult to kind of uh, go around. Is like you know, you will have all kinds of roads. Most of the roads there will you will probably need multimodal vehicles to kind of traverse those. You know, in some cases it will be only two wheelers. In some other cases you can possibly run run go only by you know, train because there are no roads. In other cases, you know, you'll have so multimodal transport, and then across a road, you might have a house number one followed by 1001 followed by A. So, you know, how you kind of you know make sense of anything if you have to kind of you know reach from point A to point B for whatever reason. And you know, data and AI can play massive roles there uh, in terms of like you know making. And this is an example where you know kind of bad infrastructure can lead to very interesting technology ideas to be applied to overcome that. Because one way you can say, oh, I will change infrastructure, but that will take 100 years. But on the other hand, how do you kind of like, you know, make, again, going back to my original thesis, improve human lives for the better by bringing in technology. So that's one. And health, you know, is just, I mean, it's a $3 trillion economy in US and let alone, you know, rest of the world. And it's enormous. And I'm also fortunate to be part of, you know, several very interesting companies applying AI. In, in solving you know health problems, so I think I think spaces like that I will probably go in, try to understand a real problem that is being being solved, and then think of what AI to use or what technology to use, not the other way around. 
So if you're an entrepreneur thinking about doing a company in the AI space, you just got four wonderful pitches for things to think I'll, about. I'll add uh, <laughs> a couple of, one, one more to that list, which is um, Hollywood has been the thriving hold of, of imagination. And my daughters have uh, eight and six young daughters. And they both uh, watch Star Trek with me on weekend. And they almost imagine that Star Trek, all things in Star Trek are available online, but father <laughs> is not rich enough to buy them yet, right? So um, I think any, any episode of Star Trek, uh, any little piece on that, whether it's uh, back when cell phone didn't exist, to, to kind of wearables that you can talk from, uh, you can pretty much take star rate X and take that imagination as an, as an inspiration and it's waiting to be done today. So, so I mean, that's kind of So a, five ideas now. The, now you have <laughs> two from Street. Start, so, start a transporter company. Yes. Um, so I'm going to be moving to audience questions. If you have a question, be sure to text the number earlier um, so that I can see it. So one question an audience member has is, when consumers see the output of AI systems, they kind of just believe that it's true. They don't really understand that AI systems have limitations and that they can be wrong. So what responsibility do you have as a company to educate consumers as to the limitations of a particular AI system, especially one that you produce? And then as a consumer, what can you do to evaluate the output of AI systems you might be using? Yeah, that's a really good question, um, you know, especially when you're dealing in, in sort of sensitive areas. It's one thing if I say, you know, hey, Siri, where's my umbrella? And she says, in the closet. And I go look there, and it's not there, because why would Siri know where my umbrella <laughs> is? Um, but it's another thing if people are you know, calling in for medical information and uh, you know, uh, list some symptoms and are, are told, you need to drop everything you're doing and go to the ER right away. Or maybe they're told, um, you know, oh, you're fine. It's just a flu, and it's actually much, something much more serious. Um, so, you know, uh, this is the reason that most AI systems have, you know, some kind of confidence score built into them that, you know, ho hopefully will give the machine some information about how certain it is about some particular outcome. Uh, but we all know that even those scores can be very, very wrong, uh, if not exactly so wrong. Um, so I don't know. It's a good question because you, you know, you don't hear a lot about companies really. Um, you know, taking responsibility in this way, other than just trying to have a fail-safe, so that um, you know, if what we generally do when we're working with companies that have some mission-critical thing that you want to do is, um, you can usually tweak things so that um, you know you might get a lot of different answers, uh, and that might be a little bit more inefficient for the person who has to sort of uh, go through those answers and select the one that's the best one, uh, versus a system that just gives you one single answer and says, here is the answer, and you know might sound very confident about it. But usually there's tweaking you can do on the back end that will determine you know whether you're giving it a, some Providing somebody a, a range of likely answers versus a smaller range of answers that you know could be right, uh, but they could also very well be wrong. Um, and so, in cases where you know a situation is really mission critical, you try to open up the AI to you know provide more information rather than a, a, you know smaller uh, area of information. Um, but I also think it's just a you know it's a public debate that needs to happen about like obviously you know Apple and Google and uh, all these people are not worrying about this with Siri and Alexa and all that if it's wrong they don't care they're not educating you as a consumer about the degree to which you know Siri gives you wrong answers um, and hopefully most of the things that you're asking Siri or Alexa are you know not important enough that it's going to make a huge deal but you know if you leave the house and you didn't bring a jacket, and you're in San Francisco, and it ends up being much colder than Alexa said it was going to be. Uh, you know, it can make make you uncomfortable. Uh, but I, but I think it's a it's you know a a, a, com a conversation in sort of ethics and best practices that uh, doesn't really exist so much in the community yet. But but we definitely need to have. So what are some of the things you would like? Like what are some of the ethical questions you would like to see companies ask more of that they currently aren't? Um, so. Uh, you know, if, if first of all, this, this there are two aspects, two sides to the problem. So one is 
consumer products are being launched with AI, which as a whole consumers haven't tested before, so they are getting a sense, sense of it. I think it will be a big, big issue for regulators as well to kind of really answer. So I don't think as a society we really, it's a very important problem, um, like very important question, and unless it is answered, I mean, it can lead to a lot of kind of unintended consequences, which people haven't even probably like, you know, thought of. Uh, but at least in the industries, this question is being being asked today. Like, you know, if they are using AI, let's say banking organizations are using AI to decide with the, you know, credit worthiness or things like that, they are actually, there is a, they are not only ethically, but I think, you know, legally also liable to offer an explanation. And a uh, lot of things around interpretability and explainability of AI the work is being done, but I don't think, you know, both technology-wise as well as ethically, what questions uh, we should be asking and what answers we would be giving. Like, you know, this this is still work in progress, and we still have to get an answer to it. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this ethics question, or how can we hold uphold values and communicate how well or how reliable AI systems are to consumers who don't necessarily have a technical background? Uh, I mean, ethics is in general like a, it's, it's a very. I mean, I think one of the problems with in this field is I've, I've suffered this myself uh, when I was working in speech is because there are biases in the data set that creep into the product in some sense, and the biases in the data set that you don't even realize and you you realize after the fact, um, like it's biased towards male or it, the biasing towards male is like super common because um, because they're they're like all the data you get is in some sense male bias so. Um, again, I was just interested. These are very hard. Like, I think people are just starting to think about these problems and mm -hmm. like, what biases do exist? What is, what is the right ethical answer? And in some, some cases, you're legally liable. And I think interpretability actually, um, like, the need, the reason we need interpretability also is because not because we really want to know how it's working. It's because how should I change the output? Like, say if I go to a bank and say. Give me a loan. Bank says I put all your data in this AI system. I tell you, you don't get a loan. I'm not interested in knowing what the neural network is doing. What I'm interested in knowing is like, what should I do to change the outcome? Uh, and that's a different question. Mm -hmm. uh, and people are now like starting to figure out how can this AI or whatever tell me what should I change to change the answer you gave me that I'm not happy with. Like same thing with the college admission or something. Like you go there, he says, you don't get in. Like, why? Or what should I change? Okay. Or a job interview. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> explainability in AI is like the, the, uh, it's a, uh, it's the emerging space, right? And we actually have uh, several papers and now product on that. So some of you saw the demos and driverless AI. But I think our community of customers are also helping us there, where they have to explain this AI to their regulators, right? Sort of. As a result, we are using a. So they, one of the one of the articles proposed at the last H2O World conference where Maria was speaking. Uh, one of the article, uh, one of the pre presentation was how do I use AI to explain AI as well? Right? Sort of. Can I now use not just AI to do AI, but can I somehow use a neural net to explain a a, a lesser say a generalized uh, a gradient boosting method with deep trees. So kind of trying to use AI to help us understand why it made this choice. And then eventually, uh, so this is the statistical underpinning. But really what, we, what customers want, what users want is, what is the scenario play? If I, did, if I change this, what is optimization and what is outcome? And that's kind of the immersive experience of AI is decision making will become much and more and more picking ABC and what will each lead to. Mm -hmm. Understanding your data becomes next level. Yeah. So I think we're almost near the end of the event. Do we have time for one last question? Or are you good? No? OK. <laughs> so there, sorry, there are so many good questions, but you can totally come up to the panel afterwards and ask them individually. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.